This morning's reading is from Matthew 6, verses 19 to 24. Matthew 6, verses 19 to 24. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Morning, everybody. I've been here the whole... Thank you. <laughs> if, you're, if you're watching live at home, morning to you as well. Um, it's a very strange feeling knowing that there could be any number of people watching from somewhere else in the world and, uh, and wondering what they are saying to their TV screens or computers, mainly when's he going to finish. And um, later is the answer. Much, much later. Anyway, um, we're going to look at those verses. I'm only smiling to myself because uh, Julie said Gary is going to come up and speak and there appeared Hendrik. And, uh, and that, that actually is quite, kind of funny as well because at Youth Club, um, on Friday evenings, um, a selection of children always come up to be, uh, both me and Hendrik and say, are you brothers? <laughs> to which I always reply, he should be so lucky. <laughs> um, although we are brothers in Christ, so that's good. But apparently we look a dead spirit of each other. Although my, my uh, Dutch accent isn't very good. A bit, he's got me more hair here on the face as well. Anyway, um, so let's, uh, let's just pray and look at God's word together, shall we? Father God, we thank you, Lord, that we can just come into this place and worship. Lord, we thank you that we can just spend that, that slightly longer time, Lord, just sitting, standing, kneeling, whatever we feel led to do by your Holy Spirit. But Lord, really trying to focus our hearts on you. And Lord, I believe you're here with us. And I thank you that you're here with us. I thank you, Lord, that you're with your people. And Lord, we so often spend much of our week distracted, much of our days, Lord, um, going through our lists and our things that we want to do, Lord. And, and so often you're kind of there at the beginning or we might think of you at the end. And, and Lord, you call us to have you at the heart of all we do. So I pray this morning, Father God, as we look at those verses Hendricks just read, that Lord, they will be an encouragement and a blessing to each one of us. And uh, we ask your blessing on this time now in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I just want to say one thing, uh, I, and I may be wrong, but as we were worshipping, I, I felt like um, I should just say something about baptism. Um, I don't know why. Um, it may just be something that um, pops into my head. Um, but I wonder, um, so I'm going to say it, and then if I'm completely wrong and, and it isn't of God, then it won't matter, will it? There's no, nothing wrong with talking about baptism. But I just wonder if um, maybe there's some people here this morning that, or a person that's it's been there somewhere in the back of your head this week, uh, and that word, baptism, has been floating around. You're a Christian, you love Jesus, and you're wondering what the next step is. Maybe you've done it. Um, I'm, trying, I'm going to look over here, just in case I look at anybody. Who didn't. <laughs> but um, I just felt, I was just as we were singing, I just thought I should say maybe if you're thinking of doing it, and you do believe in Jesus, and you've not done it, then I encourage you to do it and take that bold step. I don't think you, regret, you won't regret it, because I think when we declare our faith publicly, I believe that God honours it, and there's many people here smiling already that will, de uh, will testify to that as well. Anyway, if you want to talk more about that, um, come see me afterwards. Um, great, so a couple of years ago, me and Andrea um, had the privilege of travelling to China. Um, we were in a, a Xi'an, which I, I don't think is probably not how the Chinese pronounce it, but that'll do for me. And uh, we were there in Xi'an, which is a walled city, and uh, we had to travel to a place called Kunming. Again, it's not how, probably how the Chinese pronounce it, but that'll do. I'm from Essex. And, uh, and so we had to get a train journey, which can only be described as a monster train journey. 36 hours it was going to take by train, with no stopping, just wallop straight the way through. 36 hours. Uh, we were running out of money, so this was the only way. We had, it wasn't a sleeper train. It was a sleeper train, but we didn't have a berth. And so we, had, we were sitting on regular chairs. 
and uh, in a carriage full of uh, people, local people, and uh, so we were also the subject of all their conversations as to why we were sitting there and, and not somewhere um, further up the train, perhaps. And so we sat there, and I thought, what can I do to make the time go? I need to somehow zone out and switch my head off. And I thought, the only way I can think of doing that is trying to read The Lord of the Rings, which, whilst I enjoy the films, is very boring, isn't it? It's kind of long and kind of dull. I know that's controversial, sorry. But, so I opened up Lord of the Rings, and I thought to myself, I should try and read all of the whole thing, big, thick book like that. That'll get me at least ten hours in. And, uh, and I, made, I managed about six pages and fell asleep. But, thinking of Lord of the Rings this morning, um, and the story kind of fits with uh, the reading Hendrick just given to us. And the whole story of Lord of the Rings focuses, unsurprisingly, around a ring. And, uh, and there are 12 rings, I believe, and they're scattered around the various kingdoms of Middle-earth. Is that right? <laughs> that do. Anyway, and, uh, and there's one ring that was made to bind them all, and one ring to rule them all. And if you had the one ring, you would be the ruler of everything. And so it was a, a great prize. And a man named Smeagol uh, came across the ring in a river with his cousin, and he was so taken by this thought of power that he grabbed it, he killed his cousin in a barbaric act. It's not a true story. Um, and he killed his cousin, he took the ring, and what's really interesting is he puts this ring on, he, the ring owns him, he becomes consumed with this thing, and he hides it and he runs and he begins to be deformed and warped, his heart changes, and in the end he forgets his name, he's called Gollum, not because that's his actual name, but because that's the only sound he made in Gollum, that was this kind of weird sound he would make from his body. And, the, and the, the message, I think, uh, for the bits I read before I fell asleep anyway, um, well, this ring kind of represents sin, desire. Tolkien, of course, had his own faith, and, and lots of his faith influences the, the Lord of the Rings. And that idea that this kind of sinful, unhealthy thing that people chase after when they get it actually has a dramatic effect and changes their character so until they're no longer what they originally were. And, and that's kind of fitting with what we're going to be talking about this morning. We're doing a three-week series um, called Heart of Worship, although it's probably not the best title. Um, a better title will be The Importance of a Right Heart. It's the importance of having a right heart. Think of Gollum. His heart was warped and twisted because he focused on the wrong things, and his whole life was completely ruined because of it. And it's important to have a right heart, a heart that is pure, a heart that is good, a heart that focuses on what's godly and holy, and uh, the Bible is very clear about that. And I want to tell you a story uh, about a young, prosperous investment banker. Um, so a story, story is told of a young, prosperous investment banker, there we are, who was driving a brand new BMW sedan uh, around a mountain road during a heavy snowstorm. As he veered around one sharp turn, he lost control and began sliding towards the edge of a steep cliff. At the very last moment, he unbuckled his seatbelt, flung open his door and leaped from the car, which then plummeted to the bottom of a ravine and burst into a ball of flames. Although he had escaped with his life, the man suffered a ghastly injury. Somehow, his arm had been caught uh, near the hinge of the door, and as he jumped out, his arm was torn clean off at the shoulder. That's kind of gross. A passing trucker saw the accident in his rearview mirror, pulled his rig to a halt, and ran back to see if he could help this poor... Those noises are normal, by the way. <laughs> this church has been here since 1816. You're quite safe-ish. It's not 18, 1860s, I think. Um, although we are hoping to bring it down, but just not this morning. <laughs> if you see cracks, just run. Just run. Um, or I'll see you in heaven. Anyway... Um, and so his, his arm was ripped off at the socket, and so the trucker runs down to see if he can help. And when he arrives at the scene, he found the banker standing at the edge of the roadside, looking down at his BMW, now, of course, a burning wreck at the bottom of the ravine. Incredibly, the banker was completely oblivious to his injury, and he moaned, my BMW, my new BMW. A trucker pointed at the banker's shoulder and said, you've got bigger problems than your car. We've got to find your arm. Maybe the surgeons can sew it back on. And then the banker looked at where his left arm had been, and he paused for a moment and groaned, Oh no, my Rolex, my new Rolex. Thank you. Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6, that story kind of fits again with what Hendrik read to us a moment or two ago. Deuteronomy chapter 6 is what we looked at last week, and we looked at the story didn't we, of Israel coming to the the River Jordan, that border of the Promised Land, that 40-year journey, and as they stood on the entrance 
of their destiny, the, going into the promised land, how we said, didn't we, last week, that their biggest problem, their biggest danger wasn't going to be the enemies they would have to fight and push out. It was going to be their heart, the state of their heart. Would they acknowledge and serve God and be obedient to all the things God had commanded and they'd agreed? Or would they let go of him and would it all spiral out of control? The heart was going to be the most important battle for God's people. And we're kind of still in the same vein as that. And this, uh, these verses Hendrik read are from the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Jesus teaching uh, about the ethics and about what, what living in God's kingdom should look like in a believer's life. And in verses 1 to 18, he talks about that from a perspective of spiritual life. Verses 19 to 34, sort of everyday stuff. And then verses 7 to 12, what it looks like to be God's people in a community as well. And the message from those verses that Hendrik read to us um, is very simply this, that your treasure is your master. And so you must pick your master carefully. The message from those verses, I'll say again, is your treasure is your master. What you prize owns you. What you go after has you, not the other way around. We often think that when I get it, it's mine. A bit like um, Frodo, uh, what's his face, Gollum. Um, but actually, as the book unfolds, we discover the ring isn't beholden to anyone. But in fact, the ring owns Gollum. Your treasure is your master, and so pick your master carefully. The BMW story fits with that, doesn't it? That was his treasure. His Rolex was his treasure, and so skewed by those two things was he that he couldn't actually see the damage it had done to his body and his life. Another story, this time still in America. Apparently every story only happens in America in churches. I don't really know why, but there we are. Uh, a story of two paddle boats uh, in the southern United States. Uh, one day they left Memphis about the same time, independent of each other, but they were traveling uh, down the Mississippi River, river towards New Orleans. Um, as they traveled side by side, they began to sort of banter with each other. Sailors from one vessel were through a few remarks at the others about how slow they were going, we're faster than you, you're going really slow, speed up, come on. Words were exchanged, it kind of got up to a new level. Challenges were made and then they began to race. These two paddle ships were racing down um, the Mississippi River. The competition became so vicious that as the two boats roared through, the, they roared through the deep south. And as they roared through, one boat began to fall behind because it didn't have enough fuel. It had plenty of coal for its trip that it was supposed to make, but not enough to race at top speed. And as the boat dropped back and the other boat took the mickey, an enterprising young sailor realized that he could throw stuff from the ship in the ovens. And so um, their cargo began to go in the ovens and it began to pick up speed again. And when the rest of the sailors saw that the supplies burned as well as coal, they all began to fuel their boat with the material they'd been assigned to carry and transport. They ended up winning the race. But when they arrived at their destination, they'd burned all their cargo. And then the tagline of this story goes like this. God has entrusted to us cargo. Children, spouses, friends. Our job is to do our part in seeing that this cargo reaches its destination. Your treasure is your master. And so pick your treasure carefully because you may win but in winning you may lose and you may lose badly let me read those verses again that Hendrik read to us it's the last time I'm going to say the word Hendrik by the way I'm conscious I've said your name now 4,000 times Hendrik 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 oh, well, I should say brother anyway um, and so I'll read those verses again that a member of the church read to us a moment ago so uh, Matthew 6 verses 19 to 24 Jesus says as part of the Sermon on the Mount, about being God's people in his kingdom. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. That in itself is kind of hard, isn't it? Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? 
No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So let's just go through those verses um, just a little bit for a, a second or two. So verse 19, Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. And Jesus is saying to his followers, those that are listening, those that believe in him and want to be different to the world around them, he's talking about the futility, not of having money, not of having wealth or treasures. That in itself is no problem. Many biblical characters, particularly in the Old Testament, were extremely well off. Um, You think someone like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they had vast flocks and land. So wealth, Jesus isn't saying, is bad inherently. He's talking about the futility of having wealth and what you do with it and where you store it. That's the issue. The issue isn't having it. It's what you use it for and where you store your wealth. And so, for example, um, if you have stuff and lots of it and it is for you only, if you are the center of of your treasure, if your treasure is stored only for you and your own life and your own well-being, Jesus is saying that is futile. I would suggest the Bible even suggests it's a bit sinful to have so much and use only for self when there are so many people around us, even in the church community, who struggle and have perhaps a lot less. Disciples are supposed to be people of generosity, God's people are supposed to be people that act like their saviour and think nothing about giving away the treasures God has first given them. We're to give our treasures away, not hang on to them for our own comfort and blessing. I love the story of Charles Wesley, who wrote a number of very, well, a number, thousands uh, of hymns, but a number of uh, well-known ones that still are sung today from time to time. And he apparently uh, made a decent uh, income from his Uh, him writing but what he did was he capped his salary apparently at a certain level a modest level and everything that was profit he gave away he didn't hoard it for himself he made sure he had enough to live on and the rest was just given away i love that i think it's a real challenge isn't it so jesus isn't saying it's wrong to have money it's not wrong to spend it it's not even wrong to store it it's what you do with it that becomes futile or wrong And also it's about where you store your wealth or your treasures. Jesus actually says, don't bother, don't store up treasure for yourself on earth. Where rust and moth and thieves can steal what you've worked so hard for. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't have a bank account if you're a Christian. Don't go home and empty out all your cash and stick it in a bag on top of the cistern in the toilets or under your mattress. That's not what he's saying. It's not a teaching away what bank you should use. The whole, the, the image of the world is an analogy analogy for where you trust what kingdom you put your trust in the one that's passing away or the one that is to come it's about priorities jesus isn't saying you shouldn't have money because you've got to put it somewhere obviously if you have any if you have treasure it's got to go physically somewhere but he's saying don't trust the world with your treasures you've got to trust someone else it's futile to store up in a world that is here but gone tomorrow This is more than good banking advice. The Bible tells us the world is passing away. And Jesus is cautioning us not to trust and store our treasures in a world that has a shelf life. But so often we do, don't we? So often we... uh, Don't worry. Don't panic. Well, you you all might want to panic on that side. But we're all right in the middle. Maybe around the edge. You guys are perfectly safe over there. (laughs) Anyway... It's double glazed, I think. Anyway, but Jesus is saying, he's cautioning us not to trust and store up treasures in a world that is, is, has a shelf life, that is leaving, that is going. The Bible says the world is going. It's going to be destroyed by fire. It has a, an end to it. But so often we invest, don't we, in this world. We invest in this world as if this is all there is. We invest in our houses and our uh, future securities. We, we treasure up because that's what everybody else does. The old adage goes, doesn't it? You can't take it with you. Everybody says it, and no one believes it. Everyone says it, and no one believes it. I read this. It was reported that there were 11 millionaires on the Titanic when it went down. That would have been a big deal back then. 
Uh, one, one passenger who left, who had with him that day $300,000 worth of money and jewellery in his cabin. As the boat began to sink, he survived. As he left, he left all of that money in his cabin. He ran out, and this is what he said afterwards. He said, the money, as the ship was sinking, the money seemed a mockery to me at the time. And then he said, I picked up three oranges instead. The treasures on earth are only treasures for a bit. And then we suddenly realize we need something far better, something more. It's a warning here, but it's also a challenge. And what Jesus does in the next verse, verse 20, as he takes that challenge, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust come. But he then flips it and makes it a positive thing. This is what you should do. This is what you should do as my followers, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. This is a warning, of course, but it's a challenge. He turns verse 19 into a positive. By all means, store up as much wealth as you can, but put it in the right place. Use it for the right things. There's no security on earth. There is no security on this world. This world is a bit like the Royal Bank of Scotland a few years ago, when actually people that had their money in lost millions, didn't they? But if you store your wealth in heaven, it will be safe and secure forever. So you might be asking, how can I get my money up to heaven? How can I get my treasures? Is there some sort of heavenly direct debit? Is it like a Western Union branch up in the, in the Holy City? And can I kind of make a phone call and move it across? No. We're not talking earthly cash. We're talking treasures of the favor of God, the blessings of God, the reward that only God can give when we get to heaven. And so how do you build up your treasure in heaven? Well, simply to serve God on earth, to be godly here, and to be generous with what God has given you before you pass away. Luke chapter 12, verse 32 puts it similarly, but well, uh, obviously it was Jesus. He says this in uh, chapter 12, verse 32. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let me read that again. Do not be afraid, little flock. We fear when our money goes down, when our treasures diminish, we fear because we have so much security in those things. Your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Wow, a kingdom. Sell your possessions, therefore. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys, for where your treasure is, your heart will be also. How do you store up treasures in heaven? By honouring God on earth. By being generous with the things God has given us. Treasures, not just money, of course. Our time, our priorities, our gifts, our skills, our reputations, our positions, whatever it may be. Putting things and using them for his kingdom and for those who don't know him. I love the fact that he says in those verses, little flock. Because it's not a telling off. I believe it's a loving saviour saying, you're going to just mess it up if you put all your money in the bank. And if you invest in this world, you're just going to mess it up and you're going to be unhappy. Listen, just give it all away and work on what's never going to let you down. Work on your treasure in heaven. He says little flock because it's a loving statement. The church often has a dodgy relationship with money, doesn't it? Um, Often when churches talk of money, uh, we get the stereotypical man, uh, it's often a man, it appears, in a a nice suit, waving his Bible at everyone and telling you all, you should be giving us all your money, the church's accounts are open, come on! There's lots of this that goes on, waving Bibles around, and often the church has got a terrible reputation. I've been to things where people will say, we need this amount for this mission, and if 100 people give 500 pounds, or if 10 people give 5,000, and they break it down, in the end you think, I'm giving you nothing. (laughs) You're getting on my nerves. and I'm taking, i give it somewhere else. I shouldn't say that, sorry. Um, That's my bad. Can you delete that? No, no, too late. (laughs) That is how I think, anyway. I even heard one church who was so pushy, he threatened to work out how much people earn. And if they didn't give what he thought they should, he told them to never come back. 
That will never be said in this church. But equally, we're probably too much the other way. We don't mention the M word, do we? We never mention money in this church because we're so holy in this church. We know God will just provide it. But maybe we should talk about it from time to time. Maybe we're equally wrong on the other direction. But the point is, Jesus is talking about our treasure. And he's just saying it, not from the perspective of filling up the coffers of a church, but because he doesn't want his people to miss out on where real treasure lies which is in the kingdom of God. Um, and then verse 21, he expands that thought. Um, you see, he talks about how, uh, this is also a warning, isn't it? Your choice of treasure will affect your heart. Verse 21, let me read it. It says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If you choose the wrong treasure in life, your heart will pay the price. Hence the title of this talk. How can I lift my hands to Jesus in abandon and worship on a Sunday morning if my mind is consumed with the treasures of this world? How can I possibly say, Lord, take me, use me for whatever you want, Lord, if really I know exactly what I want in 10 years' time, if I've decided what I'm doing with my life? Let me ask a question of all of us, myself included. If I was to say, where are you going to be in five years' time? What are you going to be doing in five years' time? What are we going to be doing in five years' time? I wonder how many of us would answer along the lines of career or houses we might live in or prestige or opportunity, those kinds of things. Not that they're wrong in themselves, but is that our main priority? Are we so consumed with those things that we forget that in five years' time we should be saying, I've told hundreds of people about Jesus Christ and changed their eternity. Heaven and hell, it's a big deal. That I'm so in love with God that it's like I see his face whenever I shut my eyes. That I know his words so much that if someone asks me a tough question, I know the answer. Shouldn't we be saying that kind of thing? Not just the other stuff that the world prioritises. I saw a talk, uh, I was hoping to play a video, but it's not worked out. So I'm going to need a volunteer in a moment. Um, Julie, do you mind? Is that all right? Can you just catch the end of that? Oh, sorry. So, um, I can't move. Am I allowed to move? No, never mind. Can everyone see the Judy or is that sorry? For the, for the benefit of those watching by tape. So um, the talk goes like this by a man named Francis Chan. He's awesome. He's really good. Um, I saw him once uh, years ago at a Christian event. It's fantastic. And he talks about um, the whole of time. So if you imagine this rope represents all of eternity. So it doesn't really end at Judy's right hand. It just continues forever and ever and ever. So this is millions and 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 millions. So it goes on, goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And then you've got a little white bit at the top. When he does it, it's the other way around. And this is about 90 years. That's billions and billions and billions, all of eternity. And this is 90 years that you live before you die. And if you trust in Jesus, this is the bit you live afterwards. Well, we all live forever, the Bible says. It's where you live that's the issue. And so the talk goes a bit like this. Isn't it tragic that people spend so much time investing in this tiny bit with no thought of all of that? When you think of the scope of eternity and that God says you can invest in this now, isn't it nuts? (laughs) to be worrying about this little tiny bit at the front. Isn't it crazy to think, I want to be so comfortable here and have so much that I don't have to worry about a thing at the expense of this bit? Because that's what the price is, isn't it? Wouldn't it be better to be so consumed with being comfortable and alive here that you're uncomfortable here? And it's a message of hope if you are struggling in this bit. Look how small it is. And this is too big, really. I was exaggerating. It's more like that compared to all of that eternity that's coming. And yet so much of our world is focused on this, as if this is all there is. But this isn't all there is. This is a rubbish treasure. This is an awful treasure. This is the prize. An eternity in God's kingdom where moth and rust and vermin and thief can do no wrong where there are no tears there is no death no sorrow no pain but how many people even christians even christians will say well when i get to this bit and i'm comfortable then maybe i'll do something for god or i'll do it but only a little bit because you know 
It's a long life. Not though, is it? It's kind of short. Might be even shorter if the window's falling. But thank you. All right. And I think that's what Jesus is saying in these verses. Get the right treasure, not the treasures of this earth. Verses 22, 23 develops it even further. It says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Uh, the word heart in Jewish literature is referring to the core of someone's character, their thoughts, their feelings, their uh, psyche, everything. And in Jewish literature as well, the eye is equivalent to the heart. So when it speaks of the eye, it's talking again about the internal, the core of a person. Jesus isn't just saying that when you put your treasure in the wrong place, you miss out. He's saying that when you put your treasure in the wrong place, it begins to affect your morality. That's the next thing that goes. Where your treasure is, your heart will be. And if your treasure's in the wrong place, your morality will go downhill very quickly. If the core is wrong of a person, morality follows quickly. And so Jesus is saying that that good eye full of light is actually about devotion to God. And that bad eye full of uh, darkness is about moral corruption. Think of Gollum again. Treasure in the wrong place, warped. And in verse 24, Jesus ends with a solemn warning and encouragement. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And that word serve in Greek isn't like employee, which is how we might like it to be. Well, I'm sort of, I work for the Lord. It's like slave You're a slave to one thing or the other. You're either a slave to the good king of kings or you're a slave to the things of this world. You cannot be a slave. You cannot serve both. And that language of slave is about exclusive property. You're either the exclusive property of God Almighty or the exclusive property of that treasure you think is so important. In other words, if you love the treasures of this world, not only will it affect our morality, it will very quickly affect our relationship with God himself. Often people will say, well, God's left me. He's not done anything for me. And sometimes I want to say, but what do you do all week? Do you spend time with him? Is he first? Do you seek him out? That's why Jesus will later on say, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter heaven. Not because they're not wanted, but because their treasure is so much in this world that the thought of going making God number one is so far from them. You cannot have both. It's one or the other. And so I don't think this passage is a kind of telling off. I believe it's challenging, but I believe Jesus is warning his disciples, warning them that as the kingdom of God comes, you've got to get ready for it. I think he's saying, don't fall in line with the rest of the world. Don't be jealous. Don't look at the lost and the world that's passing away. Don't be jealous of what they've all got. Don't go after the things the world celebrates. There's no point. It won't be here in however many thousands of years. In Christ, you've already got a better treasure. In Christ, I think Jesus is saying, you're liberated from the burden of worldly wealth and treasure. You don't have to constantly worry about it. You can just give it away and trust in God to provide for your needs. And two verses, uh, two passages to finish on. Philippians chapter, chapter 4, verses 12 to 13. Paul says this, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Paul had times of plenty and times of nothing every time he trusted in God because his treasure was in heaven. And then Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, and this is what we're talking about. Paul again writes, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. 
In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth. In him we are also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who are the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit who is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. He's blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. The mature Christian knows this. And the mature Christian lives as if they are the richest person the world's ever seen. But rich according to heaven, not according to earth. And so let's just finish with a couple of questions, a little response. Judy, I may need you again, sorry. Let's just take a moment. And let me ask a question. I'm just going to hold this at the same time. How is your relationship with God this morning? What's it like? How is your heart this morning? Have you been feeling like God has left you, maybe? Has it all gone a bit cold and a bit bit quiet internally? And there might be many reasons for that. Sometimes we go through difficult times. Sometimes it's just the way of our emotions. But maybe it's worth considering this morning, have we put him in the wrong place? If our heart is where our treasure is, who is our real master as Christians in this room this morning? Where is our treasure Have we chosen our master carefully? Or are we hoping to serve two side by side? God won't have it. He's a jealous God. He wants all of you. He doesn't want a bit. He doesn't want ten minutes in the morning and three at the end. God wants to be in every decision, every moment, every walk, every conversation. He wants every part of you. Because he loves you and he gave his son for every single one of us. Who is our real master? Who is our real treasure? And therefore the question is, what steps do we need to take, myself included, to make sure that our heart is looking for this as our treasure and not this here? If Christ is our best treasure, if we've been liberated from the burden of worldly treasure, what sort of things can we do to make sure that we don't make this our goal? To make this our goal. Let me pray, and then we'll sing our final song. Let's just take a moment. Let God speak to you. Just to be open. Be open. Let the Holy Spirit just challenge and, and encourage. Remember that phrase, little flock. This isn't a, a teaching by Jesus to, to have a go. This isn't a, a secret way of getting money out of people for, for the church coffers. Not at all. This is a saviour who wants his people to be free. To not be running around from place to place trying to get more like the people of this world so often do. And pay the price at home or within their own bodies. This is Jesus pointing us away from the little bit to the eternal. This is Jesus saying you can live a richer life. You might have a lot less, but you'll have so much more. This is Jesus saying to those who struggle already. You are rich beyond even the most stretched imagination on this earth. You have a kingdom. Every heavenly blessing is yours in Christ. There's just a delay coming to you. But one day you will stand in God's new city, the new Jerusalem. And this will seem but a memory. I'm going to pray and if you want to join me at the end, say Amen. Father God, Lord, I want to just say before you that I have tried to have my cake and eat it. I've tried to serve two masters. 
Lord, you've blessed me abundantly with material things, but not just material things. Lord, you've blessed me with gifts and talents. You've blessed me with skills, but yet, Lord, I've used them for me. I've used them for what I want to do, my ambitions. I've not looked for your, you and your ambitions in my life. And Lord, I want to say sorry, because this world is passing away. That is what we believe. And yet, Lord, maybe I seem no different to anybody else. Lord, forgive me for not being radical. Forgive me, Lord, for following the rat race and following the line, Lord, and prioritizing what the world prioritizes. Lord, begin to show me what it means to be a radical follower of Jesus. Lord, help me to be like Paul, to know the contentment of having much and little. Show me that secret. Take away the fear of having less. And Lord, if I have less, bring the hope that there is more. Lord, I offer you my life again. And Lord, I renounce my old master. And I say, Lord, you're my only king and I love you with all my heart. And I say, Lord, use me. Use me, Lord. Show me how you would have me live. Give me the strength and the boldness and the faith to be so different. And we pray this in Jesus' name.